Yes, the hour of judgment has come. Can I do this or not? Can I look out into the sanctuary and see familiar faces? The guy who thinks I should be a Baltimore Oriole and a Redskins fan and not a Yankee and a Giants fan. My brother John, who we labored together in Greater New York Conference, he with the school and I as the pastor of the Jewish Adventist Church. Folks who have been patients, folks who have struggled with me as a chaplain, labored with me in prayer. Can I do this at this very moment in time? It's frightening. But God is good to us. The call came from the med psych unit chaplain. We need to have you here right now. We need to share this experience with you. And so I went to med psych and spoke with the music therapist and she had a patient who during the time that she had been there was not responsive to much of anything. A woman in her 90s and one day the music therapist thought we need to try something different and so she took her guitar and she simply played the tune Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's the extent of my singing. But there was a responsiveness in that woman's eyes that had not been there before. Because something sparked within her a memory, an experience, a love. We want that this morning, don't we? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, spark within us something that will rekindle an imagery, a relationship, a love that's been alive, it's been hot, it's been cold, and it's even been dormant. Renew within us a love for you and a preparation for your coming. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I sat in Central Park, John, Woman's Ice Skating Ring. I'd been working there during the summers for a couple of years. And I sat there in 1966 with a young gal who was a member of the Mormon Church. And Lillian turned to me. I'd met her at the ice skating rink where I'd been working. My twin brother was a skate guard there, and I was working in the restaurant. And Lillian turned to me and she said, Jesus is coming back by the year 2000. And so being a real wizard at math, I figured up, okay, let him come. I'll be in my 50s. What do I care? But I don't know anything about Jesus. Let it happen. What does a Mormon girl tell a Jewish kid from the South Bronx about Jesus coming in the year 2000? Well, 2000's come and gone. But I can attest today, I believe Jesus is coming soon. I know a lot more in those 40 plus years than I did sitting on a rock overlooking Mormon's ice skating rink. I know a lot more about who Jesus is and I know more about his coming than I did. And we are living in a time in which we will see things rapidly happening, we will see lives rapidly changing, and we will see lights being rekindled and lights going out spiritually. It tells us when Jesus comes again, there are going to be two classes of people, and it would be, if it were possible to separate the congregation in two halves, I'd do it. We've entitled this, Which Side Are You On? It says two classes of people, the righteous and the wicked. One class ready to meet the Lord, the other will not be. It tells us that one class will meet him in the air and be taken to heaven at the time, and the other class will be smitten by the brightness of his coming. One class is going to look out into the heavens and in the awful 
but glad day and shout, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for the Lord, and he will save us. This is the Lord. He, we have waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And then it tells us that the other group, the other class will call for the rocks and the mountains will fall on them to hide them from the glorious face of Christ. One class eternally saved, the other eternally lost, according to our scripture readings that we've shared this morning. So which side are you on? And are you comfortable where you are and do you want to change sides to that which is going to receive salvation or that which is going to be lost. It's a matter of choice that we all are going to make. And some of us feel comfortable enough that we don't need to make any changes in our lives spiritually. And yet there is others of us who may need to make dramatic changes in our life because we are not where we need to be in relationship to who Christ is and salvation. So which side are we on? Now, I can't answer that for you. I can answer for me that I think that there need to be changes made and only God can do that. It tells us in God's word when Jesus talked about the second coming and its suddenness and its unexpectedness, he said, be also ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man's going to come. Be ready. Observe that he doesn't say, that, observe he says, be ready, not get ready. Though there must be a getting ready before one can be ready. In the military, they teach us to be prepared and be ready. The Marine General told us that we needed to train every day as if we were not, as if we were going to war. And then he told us to go home and pray every night that you don't have to go to war. But we needed to be ready. We needed to be trained. And I believe that every one of the Marine officers that he was talking to were thinking, this is what life is all about, that readiness, that preparedness, because if push comes to shove and they call us up, we have to go. There's no saying I'm not ready. And I remember the doctor and I looking and thinking, what do we need to do as the medical staff and the spiritual staff to be ready should this infantry battalion of Marines be mobilized. Be ready. How is one to get ready so that they may be ready? It's interesting to note that the answer is found in the Bible because the Bible says to us now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before his coming. We need to place our relationship with Jesus. Brian, are you playing with me up there? Okay. Those aircraft carrier guys, you've got to watch out for them. We've got to place ourselves in relationship with him and with confidence, not be ashamed of his second coming. We need to be prepared. Jesus abides in us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we need to allow God's Spirit to abide in us if we are going to be ready for His coming. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit abiding within us to turn our lives around, to bring about a spiritual experience, a change in life that allows us to accept Christ as our Savior, as our Lord, so that we might stand as part of the redeemed of all ages. That we might be part of that group that says, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and we are ready to receive him and receive eternal life. Before Jesus left talking with his disciples, he got away for a little while to comfort them, and he spoke these words. He says, If you love me, keep my commandments. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that you may be able to abide forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells within you and shall be in you. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. 
I will come to you. And at that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So Jesus dwells within us through the Holy Spirit. Observe the words of Jesus. I go. I will not leave you, orphans. I will come to you. I go. I come. Referring to the Holy Spirit. I will pray the Father, and he will give you a comforter that he may abide with you forever. And it is then by the Holy Spirit's abiding within that Christ abides within us, that we have this experience of being ready for his second coming. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. He knocks, that's his part. The opening is our part. We need to open that door and allow God to come in, to abide with us, to sup with us, so that we may be one with him. A young gal in Central Park shared the coming of Jesus. I wasn't ready to know about that. But it was when a young nurse shared the love of Jesus with me in a hospital in Southern California, a young nurse who was taking care of a Marine buddy of mine, the only survivor out of six in a tragic accident, who shared the love of Jesus with me that I was ready to respond. She shared a beautiful book, Steps to Christ, with me, and I read that book, and I thought, well, how much sense this makes about who God is in my need of God in my life. And as I read that book and began to ponder where I was in my relationship with God, believing I was where I should be spiritually as a young Jew, but not really knowing who God was as my Savior. And as I read that book, I began to make decisions about where I needed to be, about allowing God to come in and transform my life and change my life, allowing God to take the things that were in my life that needed to be cleared away, you know, we see these television programs where people come in and they bear their heart and soul to America and say, come and look at my dirty house. Look at how I have all this clutter. Look at how I hoard all these things and I can barely move from room to room. And they want people to come in and clean their house up, allowing all of America to see the way they live. And they come in and they help them clear away the clutter, but they have to be willing to give up things in order to have a clean house. They have to be willing to part with those things that may have memories and some importance to them without surrender, without giving something up, you can't have the clean house that's necessary. And ultimately, you see them having a revelation of what a clean house can look like, the transform transformation and the change. And there's some surprised faces. There's some faces that aren't so happy with what the new look might be. And you wonder how long will it take for them to get back where they were before. The clutter, the mess, the disorganization. But when we allow God to come in and clear away the door of the heart, all of the rubbish and the cherished idols and the habits and the practices of the flesh and sin in all of its forms so that Jesus through the Spirit may enter in and abide with us, then we will know that Christ is there. A lot of people stumble here. A lot of people feel they do not need to have Christ clean up the house. They do not thirst for him to come in. They're not willing to make a full and complete surrender clearing all, away all of the rubbish that blocks the opening of the door of the heart. And to have Christ abide within calls for a full and complete surrender, complete consecration, a detachment from everything one knows to be wrong and sinful, and a full attachment to Christ. It's not an easy step to take, and sometimes we have to be on our knees or flat on our back before we can look up and God can say, now do I have your attention? Now can I do what I need to do in your life? An old pastor in New York City, Brother Ron Howard, uh, not Ron Howard, uh, 
Hal Thompson said, the Lord will teach us in adversity what we neglect to learn in prosperity. He'll teach us in hard times what we've neglected to learn in good times. And Jesus says that in the last days, people will be thirsty. He says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believes on me, as the scripture has said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. Have you ever really been thirsty? Have you been out there on the trail in the Appalachians or up on the parkway hiking for hours and run out of water? Have you been in a desert experience where the water has just been depleted, it's been so hot that you don't have any extra water to drink and so thirsty that you don't know how you're going to go on? My son called me the other day from Kuwait. I said, Mark, how, how hot is it? He said, 130 degrees. He says, but Dad, it's Ramadan out here, and we have to stay on our base. If we leave our base, we cannot take extra water with us or food because of Ramadan. They observe from sunrise to sunset a fast, and we in the military cannot take extra water. We can't be seen drinking or eating during those periods of time. And I'm thinking, there's a safety issue here. I would want to have as much water as I possibly could. Have you ever really gone thirsty? When you're really thirsty, you can't think about anything else. It captures the mind. You can't give an, undiv an undivided attention to other things. To satisfy the thirst becomes the most important and only important thing in life. What about spiritually? You know, there was a soldier in, in the Great War who had gone without water for several days. And he said this, he said, I was so thirsty that I would give in my right arm to have a drink of water. And then after reflecting on that later on, he said, I would have given both my arms to have a drink of water. And then later on, he expressed this, that I would have given my life for a drink of water. Do we feel the same way about being spiritually nourished through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Are we so thirsty for the Holy Spirit that we would be willing to give everything that we have in exchange for that life-giving spiritual drink? that Jesus offers to us. That must be the desire of our hearts. It tells us in God's word, as the heart panteth after the water, and the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. The psalmist wrote those words. His heart thirsted after God. We read of David's experience, and it's a yo-yo experience like none others. It's an experience where all the things that one would imagine are going right spiritually because he's staying in tune. He's fulfilling that 27th Psalm. And John, when I was ordained, John Lawrence was there. I was asked what was my favorite passage of Scripture, the 27th Psalm. Lord, the one thing have I desired that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. David's heart wanted that more than anything. And yet we see the change in David's life going back and forth until he reaches that 51st Psalm. Lord, I have sinned before you and you alone. I was born in iniquity. I have sinned. And he says, cleanse me. Give me a new heart. Take me to your laundry room, as the message version says, and scrub me clean on your washboard of salvation. And God says, David, are you clean? And he looks up and says, no, Lord, scrub me some more. Do some more cleaning work in me. Are we ready to be clean like David and allow God to give us that transforming heart? And David says, Lord, when you've done all this cleansing work on my life, when your spirit has so captivated me and filled me, when you've given me that new heart, then I will tell others of who you are. 
I will share the good news of salvation with others. What side are you on today? The side that is ready to meet the Lord no matter what we face on a daily basis, what trials and conflicts come down, that we are so firm in God that we are able to say, I am ready to be taken. Or are we on that side that says to the rocks and the mountains, fall on us, hide us from the glory and the face of Christ? Only you know where you are. But I can tell you that when we allow God to take control, when we allow ourselves to be filled with the Spirit, when we allow ourselves to relinquish those things that block the cluttered house of our lives, things are going to happen for us. And some of those things are God's going to bring new life to us. Jesus speaking to the disciples about the coming of the Holy Spirit says, because I live, you shall live also. Again, we read that the Spirit is life. And we want to be alive. We want to have that life. It tells us in his word that he brings the love of God. The scripture says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. It also tells us that he brings the power of God into the life. For living a godly life and witnessing for Christ, Acts 1.8 says there's power that comes. It says he brings the righteousness of Christ into the life in Romans 8.10. It tells us when you allow the Holy Spirit to come in and take control of your life that he writes the law of God on the tables of our hearts so that we can be in compliance with being faithful to him in obedience. He brings the mind of Christ to predominate over the carnal mind so that we may keep the law to which the carnal mind is not subject. And when Christ abides within us and we have that experience, it tells us that we will be transformed and changed. He tells the disciples, it is expedient for you, for your advantage that I go away, for I go not far away, Because the comfort is going to come unto you, but if I depart, I will be there to encourage and strengthen you through the indwelling of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, 88 times mentioned. In Galatians, it tells us that he brings the Spirit of the crucified, resurrected, triumphant, ascendant, glorified, and enthroned Christ into the heart. God's Spirit, touching our hearts, transforming our lives, cleaning the clutter, allowing us to stand as part of the redeemed of all ages, is a choice and decision that we need to make if we are going to be victorious in awaiting the second coming of Jesus. Power of God in the life, to live a life of victory over sin and to witness for God in life and words. God fulfills his new covenant promise to us. I will put my law into your heart and the inward parts and write them in your hearts. His spirit leads us and in the plan of salvation Both man and his home are to be redeemed and restored. Christ died to redeem us, to restore us, to renew us, to create in us a new image, a new life, a new way. Tells us that one who is redeemed by the Holy Spirit and allows the Holy Spirit to dwell within us is going to be dead to the pleasures and the fashions, the habits and the customs of the world. And worldlings will not be ready for Christ's coming, whether they are in the church or out of the church. If we allow the world to control our time, our efforts, our thoughts, we are not going to be ready for Jesus' coming. If we allow God to be in control, there will be a power in the life that's going to lift us above our sins, the world and the flesh 
because we will not place our affections on the things below, but on the things above. When we allow Christ to dwell within our hearts by the Holy Spirit, we will be ready for Jesus coming, whether he comes at evening or at midnight or if he comes in the early hours of the day. The blessed hope for the believer today in a readiness for Christ's coming, in a preparation to share in the realization of the hope that he offers to us. When we think of those who have gone before, the second coming and the coming of Christ was to be a reality. To Adam, it was to be the long-lost Eden restored. To Abraham, it will be the heavenly country with the city which was built with hands and whose foundation is God. To Moses, it will be the promised land. To David, it will be the new earth where the meek shall dwell. To Isaiah, it will be the Beulah land. To Daniel, it will be the saints of the Most High, taking the kingdom and possessing it forever and ever. To Peter, it will be the inheritance incorruptible. To John, it will be the new earth with a new Jerusalem. To Paul, it will be the ushering in of the eternal weight of glory to all the redeemed. It will be their paradise home. What side are you sitting on today? Are you comfortable where you are, or do you need to make a shift in position in the church and in relationship with God? We must all be there. We must all not miss it. We have been elected to be there in Christ and we will have to give diligence to make our calling and election sure. But you and I must know that the only way to have an inheritance on the new earth is through the new birth. And as Jesus said to Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of the Lord. May every one of us have an experience so that last, at last an entrance shall be ministered unto the us abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Time to clean house. Time to open the door and say to God's Spirit, come in, change me, fill me, reorganize me, scrub me clean as you did, David, and open my heart and my eyes and my mind to the fulfilling of the promises that have been made. When I heard Jesus was coming in 1966, it didn't mean anything. When I hear that Jesus is coming soon, it means everything. Let's pray. Most loving and gracious God, not for our sake, God, no, not for our sake, but for your name's sake, show your glory. Do it on account of your merciful love. Do it on account of your faithful ways. And do it so none of those who do not know you can say, where, oh, where is your God? Amen. Amen.